many different places around the world. All right, today we have two speakers, two amazing speakers, um, Eric Elizabeth and Tarek Smith. There's a connection between them. Uh, Eric is a PhD student here in the Department of Computer Science, and Tarek is his advisor. And Eric came to us from um, Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, where he was where he got his bachelor's and master's degree. And since he's been here, he has um, done some industry internships including, let's see, Amazon, Microsoft Research Thing, and uh, Twitter Cortex. And he has a postdoc lined up. He's graduating this spring and going to Cambridge Machine Learning Group in Cambridge, England, University of Cambridge. And Torek is well known to everybody probably in this room, um, internationally known for his work in machine learning. He's a professor here in the Department of Computer Science for the Joint Country Statistics. He's also the founding director of the UCI Data Science Initiative, and before that was the founding director of the one that is named like three because I can't remember it, um, the Center, UCI Center for Machine Learning and Intelligent Systems, which he did from 2007 to 2014. And I can attest to the fact that he is internationally known for that and all his other work because as I travel around the world, people always ask me about him. They don't always get his name right, but I know who they're talking about. <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I guess uh, he's going to go Okay, all right, thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you for all coming out on a Wednesday instead of Thursday. Um, so as uh, Jessica mentioned, uh, Eric is my PhD student. He's escaping uh, defenses next week. Before he escapes, we thought it would be useful to uh, uh, give to the, particularly the statistics department, that's our primary audience here, uh, our perspective on deep learning, and uh, which Eric's thesis is, is largely about. Um, so, you know, this is a familiar story you know, around campus uh, and other places. You're in statistics, you have a collaborator in uh, sciences, social science perhaps, and uh, you're saying, well, yeah, you're building these statistical models uh, and all this math and key values. You know, maybe we could use a deep network instead to solve our problems. Uh, they were really about deep learning, and uh, they've heard about TensorFlow, and they've read a, a, an article in the New York Times and they have made an article about deep learning. And you're a statistician, and your response uh, is a complicated question of what you say. So hopefully, after today's talk, you can perhaps uh, say a little bit more than it's uh, not always easy to answer these questions. So the motivation is, uh, you know, deep learning is, is attracting a huge amount of attention. Uh, but if you're a statistician, the language of deep learning, it's, it's, it's somewhat uh, alien, uh, not using familiar terms. and. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, like much of machine learning, deep learning has statistical <coughs> ideas at its core. And so uh, the motivation for today's talk is to help bridge this gap. So again, we're really aiming at statisticians. And if you don't know too much about deep learning, that, that's actually perfect because that's what we're talking to. Uh, deep learning is a huge field. Uh, Pierre at the back teaches a 10-week class on just on deep learning. Uh, so in 15 minutes, we're only just barely going to skin the surface. There will be lots of things like convolutional neural networks and reinforcement learning and so forth that we would say very little about today. So as I said, the audience is primarily statisticians, and if you're an applied statistician, say you're going to industry, you're <coughs> on the industry came here today, uh, you know, I think it's important to be aware of what deep learning is, especially going forward for a number of statisticians, what it can do well and perhaps what its limitations are. And if you're a researcher, faculty, or you uh, aspire to be faculty, um, I think there's opportunities to use deep learning in, in statistical modeling in the right context, and also to bring statistical thinking into deep learning. We could we would welcome more of that. All right, so just to motivate uh, get things rolling, uh, Eric and I are going to alternate. You'll hear from Eric in a little bit. Um, let's take a very simple prediction problem. We have pairs of x's that are vectors and y's that are some target value, and we want to build a predictive model. This is typically what we're doing in machine learning. We want to predict y given x, and we're going to use some black box f of x with parameters w. Uh, we'll get to what those are in a minute. And you know, imagine the type of problem we're interested in is x might be very high dimensional. It might be a set of pixels and images, um, and y might be just a categorical label. Is it a dog, is it a cat, or something like that. Now we could use a logistic uh, model, for example, a, a linear model, one weight per input. But let's say we want to explore more complex models. That's uh, what we might want to do. So I took this figure from uh, actually a very nice chapter in Efron and Casey Luke, uh, where they do a very nice summary of, of neural networks and deep learning. And uh, this is a state-of-the-art neural network from the early 1990s. And there's a few of us in this room who are old enough to have been around. Uh, so let's kind of explain. We have the inputs here. Um, here's our four inputs. Usually there'll be thousands of inputs. Here's what we're trying to the prediction of the model. And um, you know, 
one way to think about what these are doing is that each of these units here is computing some function of the input. So imagine that this is one logistic function with four weights going into it and then a bias term. And then perhaps we had another logistic function here with its own weights. So instead of having a single logistic function, we, here we have five of them. And then they're going to be combined weighted to produce an output. So this is a, a more complicated model. And it's an example of a simple uh, neural network. This is called the, the hidden layer. So I think most people have seen this. Uh, the idea in the last few years, the excitement has been to go to deeper networks where we take that same idea, where we, now we, we had these guys before, but we essentially do this recursively. So each of these are computing some function of the inputs. You can think of them as basis functions, adaptive basis functions of some sort. And then we take those and we type them through another set of uh, uh, you know, sort of feature attractors or basis functions and so on. So we're going to talk more about the details of this and how it relates to concepts and statistics. Uh, but conceptually, this is at a high level. Uh, this is what a, a deep neural network looks like. And back in um, the early 90s, people knew these models existed. We could write them down, multi-layer deep neural networks. Uh, but they were very difficult to fit today. We didn't have a lot of data, um, a lot of computation. The optimization tricks were known and so forth. All right, so the, the key point is that uh, this is not a, a linear model. There's nonlinearities that you have blue dots here. And the type of nonlinearities, uh, there are various types of threshold functions, self-threshold function, functions, and so forth. Uh, these, this is an example of a particular uh, network where it's uh, recognizing street signs. Oops, I think they're wrong. All right. All right, uh, recognize street signs. So the internals of these models can have different types of nonlinearities, different types of units, different types of computation. So there's one of the things that we can come up, uh, or, you know, we see throughout the talk is that there's a fair bit of engineering in terms of figuring out the structure of these models. They're not like simple linear models. We have a lot of options uh, when we build these models. Um, the question, a very natural question, if you're a statistician, is. Uh, uh, we now have this function from inputs to outputs. It's a, it's a mathematical function. It has parameters, weights, w. How do we how do we fit those? So imagine we just have a single, simple, <laughs> that. Uh, have to learn how to uh, use this. Um, this is our simple single hidden layer network. Uh, so it's, we've got our logistic functions, multiple of them, and then we have another logistic function, say the output. How would we learn these weights? Uh, one important point is that the, we, we take an objective function here. Um, we're going to minimize this. Uh, this doesn't look like anything you're familiar with in statistics, but in fact, uh, this is actually a condition of log likelihood with a negative sign outside it. So we're really maximizing log likelihood. Very familiar to uh, statisticians. And the other term here is some kind of regularization. If you're Bayesian, you think of it as a log prior. So again, Eric will talk in more detail about this. But the optimization problem that's been set up here is, is, is something that's very familiar to statistics. There is a likelihood function in most of these neural network models, in effect. All right. Um, so uh, we can think conceptually we have these uh, multi-layer uh, networks that are computing recursively these functions of the inputs and eventually producing an output. One useful way to think of these, not everybody thinks about it this way, is that you can think of all the layers up to the last one as essentially feature extractors, just transforming the inputs maybe into some kind of invariant representations, pixels or something like that. And then the last part, in, a, in essence, you could think of as more of a conventional linear statistical model where maybe there's a, a nonlinearity here. So all this stuff is, you could think of as producing effectively the variables of one queen, and we can think of this as a statistical model built on this thing uh, down here. Now, for many years in, in computer vision, we spent a lot of time trying to hand engineer these things, build them, uh, filters and templates and so forth. One of the nice things now is that uh, these can be learned directly from, from the data. So the whole thing is differentiable and optimizable. Uh, what do these representations learn? This is a little bit cherry picked. Not always these internal representations are so easy to look at. But for images in particular, uh, you can think of them as filters or templates. Uh, so when you do that optimization of the, the log likelihood, uh, at the earlier layers, you may be getting careful with this, and you may be getting um, you know, uh, edge detectors and things like that that are being uh, affected this is representing the weights. Later on, you're going to be getting templates, and this is for face recognition. Uh, you know, the, the different layers make, are representing uh, different functions of the input that are relevant for prediction. And uh, again, this is all parameterized, all learned from the data. Now, why people are excited about this for, uh, in, in recent years is that these types of models have produced uh, significant improvements on standard benchmark tests, tasks 
in areas like computer vision and speech recognition. So this is the ImageNet visual recognition challenge. We have uh, time on the x-axis here in years. This is the error rate. Uh, a few years ago, it was at 25 percent. This uh, task has, I think, a thousand classes and hundreds of thousands of images. So it's quite a complex classification task. Uh, human level the disagreement between humans is down around five percent, and uh, you know the big jumps started to happen a few years ago from 25 percent down to 15, down to five percent with the introduction of deep neural networks. So people got very excited, very interested in this. I've heard that some of the papers that initially actually got rejected on this because people didn't believe that uh, the vision competences could be done. So for grad students whose papers are getting rejected, this is some encouragement. You might be on something I need to do. Not necessarily always. Other areas in uh, gameplay, a big area in AI that for years has been very difficult, there's been some really impressive progress. Uh, this is in Computer Go, and again, uh, time is on the x-axis here. It shows uh, kind of systematic search methods then Monte Carlo search, and then the more recent uh, significant advances, you probably heard about this, being able to beat uh, professional players in Go, which has been very, very difficult for many years, uh, enabled by the use of uh, function approximators, pattern recognizers built into the algorithms for, for playing Go. So this is part of the excitement coming from these kind of benchmark tasks in AI, and machine learning, and computer vision. Uh, so what have, we, what have we been saying so far? So deep network, uh, it, it's, it's a function, it's not something magic, it's a, it's a parameterizable function with parameters. In effect, a uh, very flexible nonlinear regression model. These hidden layers, or you could think of them as extracting some representations from the raw data, uh, pixels, but also the, you know, other types of inputs. Uh, unlike uh, statistics, where if you're extracting latent features, there's often distributional assumptions uh, in uh, neural networks, these, these hidden variables feel like don't have their deterministic functions to begin with. We'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, now, one thing uh, from some of those pictures I showed you, if you start to add up how many edges there were, by thousands of pixels of the input and lots and lots of hidden layers, there's going to be potentially be millions of parameters. And so I think an important point is that in a traditional statistical sense, these are not parameters you can sort of sit down and isolate and look at the confidence interval and interpret them. They're, uh, you know, they're, the focus here is on prediction, not on the parameters themselves. And that's a big difference, I think, between uh, a lot of statistical modeling and a lot of machine learning. And we've seen that these parameters are estimated by effectively uh, minimizing the negative uh, log logic. All right, now, uh, to, if we have millions of parameters, we better have tens of millions of data points to fit those. And indeed, this is the regime where deep networks tend to work particularly well. And something that's not always appreciated is that there's significant engineering to get these models to work. So those examples in computer vision and reinforcement learning did not sort of happen with one grad student overnight going, aha, I got a brilliant model here. It's teams of people, very bright PhD students at places like DeepMind, Facebook, and elsewhere, uh, that did a lot of search over structure and, and tuning and so forth. Um, and the success stories so far have often been in pattern recognition type tasks, so a little different from traditional, maybe, say, uh, statistical modeling in a medical context, uh, where there's large amounts of labeled data, the inputs are high dimensional. So you really do need to extract some features to make predictions. Where model interpretability is, is not a priority, because these models are very difficult to interpret. And so image analysis, speech recognition, text analysis, this is where we've seen a lot of, a lot of these advances. Um, now, just to give you an idea how complicated these networks are, yeah, this is from a few years ago. Uh, this is a deep network from Google for image recognition, and it has 27 layers. So the pixels are way up at the top. The outputs, basically, a distribution over the classes, given the pixels go through all of these transformations. This is a huge model space. It's, you know, again, you know, they searched over a lot of possible models to come up with this. And you're reminded, looking at this, if you're familiar with the uh, Rube Goldberg machines, sort of a little reminiscent. You don't know what Rube Goldberg machines is. You can look it up on Wikipedia afterwards. Uh, but you know, very complicated machinery, and you sort of wonder, how did somebody come up with this? So um, you know, I'll be handing off uh, to Eric at this point, but uh, you can read this cartoon. This is your machine learning system. You pour data in. Uh, what if the answers are wrong? Well, stir the pot until it looks right. So there are principles here, but uh, there's also a lot of experimentation. It's a very big space to be looking through. And so I think you know most researchers in deep learning would, would admit that we, we still need more principled approaches. I think statisticians, statistics can, can play a role here. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Eric, who's going to talk about uh, the next uh, part of the talk. 
everyone, thanks for having us. Um, this is kind of a satisfying talk to give because, you know, back in the day when I was five years ago, when I was in first year, you know, I was taking these intro stats classes and, you know, I'd hear about GLMs and p values and then I'd read deep learning papers and, you know, it just seemed like it was a totally different world. So hopefully, you know, at least this is kind of matching them up in my own head, hopefully yours too. Um, but yeah, so the remainder of talk, I'm going to talk about uh, generalized linear models, um, more about the model fitting part, and then connection between autoencoders and factor analysis, and then recurrent neural networks and state space models uh, before we that part. And I'll talk about some open research problems that maybe you contribute at the end. Um, yeah, so let's just build a neural network from a GLM. So you, know, you should all remember your basic stats class. Um, you know, if you don't, you know, Dan might be mad at you. But uh, you know, <laughs> take a, you know, you, you know, input features x. You know, you vector parameters w, and uh, maybe a bias, and then you, you, you know, multiply those together and throw it through some link function, and that gives you your expected value of y given x. And yeah, for example, logistic regression, you can use the logistic function, uh, you know, y is 0, 1, and we're trying to map to the mean of the parameter over there. Um, and so kind of translating to deep learning diagrams, you know, you have like an input vector x, you know, some computation here, and that would produce the expected value. Um, but what if we define a latent feature model via a GLM? You know, so we can define our GLM, but here let's just have some variable h that doesn't necessarily have a meaning. And then we can define our second layer GLM, you know, our, our mapping from y to x, you know, via h. You know, h has become some, you know, latent feature that we don't necessarily know what it is. Um, and then so translating that into a, you know, neural network diagrams, you know, now we predict some variable h, and then from h predict the expected value. Um, you know, I say, well, why don't we just add a couple more latent features, and then use all of them to predict the output? And then if we just kind of collect everything and put it in matrix notation, you know, you have you know, now a, a matrix here and then a vector here. Um, but then this is essentially a deep neural, or not a deep neural network, but one layer neural network. We're now, you know, translating the terms into, you know, what a deep learning might, person might say. You have your our first uh, link function is now called an activation function. Um, you know our first set of parameters now a weight matrix. Um, our you know latent feature is now a hidden unit or a neuron. Um, you know this is now called a hidden layer. And then yeah, you neural know, network. And then so to get to deep neural networks, we just apply this process over and over again. And that's a deep neural network. But you know a key thing to notice here though. That change notation from the kind of usual link function notation g to f, because now these are activation functions. They aren't necessarily tied to the data anymore. You know, our link function is picked based on the support of y, but now you know f is more of an engineering choice, and, and we're going to pick it uh, due to you know, help our optimization and things like that. And so, you know, as Corey mentioned before, we can really just think of these things as you know, doing adaptive basis function regression, where you know now our last set of hidden features just can be thought of some um, you know, computation involving x done by all the new neural network layers. And so, you know, now I'll talk more about how to, you know, grade based optimization for these things, because, you know, you can't really just talk about the model without talking about optimization, so that is kind of one of the key features of it. And as Port said, we're going to maximize the uh, conditional log likelihood, just summing over all the points, you know, y and x, and all the weight and bias parameters. And we're going to do this. Uh, uh, the optimization based on just first order gradient descent, where we just take our, the gradient of our uh, likelihood function and multiply some by small small sum value, call it learning rate or step size, and just add it to our last estimate of our parameters. And you know, usually these things are done with really big data sets, so we have to subsample the data and do a stochastic gradient update where we'll approximate the full data uh, gradient with some subsample. And just a little more about this, you know, a full gradient update will usually be, you know, more stable and reliable, moving to some minimum here. But really, you know, stochastic gradient will, you know, move around a bit more. But hopefully still converge to the, the minimum. And while, you know, here I've written it as like a very simple minimization function, you know, neural network loss surfaces do not actually look like this. You know, they're actually, you know, millions of dimensions and highly non-convex. So um, what deep learning has really taught us a lot about is optimization landscapes and the power of non-convex optimization. You know, usually people thought these surfaces were non-convex and you know first-order methods would never converge. 
Uh, but now people have shown that the many of the critical points, you know, with gradient zero, is actually a saddle point. You know, so here's a maxima, and here's a saddle point. And the intuition of why this is, uh, you know, why this happens, is that it's very hard to build a high-dimensional wall. You know, if you have a million dimensions, you know, you can't make sure that every single one of those million dimensions is going in the same direction. Usually there'll be one going down, and you can escape through that, you know, one or millions going down. And then two, you know, people thought all oh, these stochastic gradient methods like they're too noisy. Actually, people have been finding that the noise helps uh, regularize the network. You know, you can find perhaps a minima that generalizes better due to this noise in the gradient, um, or it can help you escape those saddle points because you know maybe it's a saddle point when you uh, visit the place in optimization space one time, but then now you're using a different mini batch, and now it's no longer a saddle point for that mini batch. And you know, just to kind of relate it back to the you know, deep learning terms. You may have heard something called backpropagation. You know, it was uh, invented by Ken Romelhar and Hinton and others in 1986. Um, it's really just the chain rule going back to the network and computing the derivatives with respect to the various weights. You know, so I have my derivative with respect to our you know, output log likelihood and taking all the way back to some layer in jail with respect to the weights in that layer. And of course, there's more to com computing efficiently. I don't want to say it's just the chain rule, but um, you know, that's kind of the core mathematical idea behind it. And, you know, what has really sped up deep learning research and expedited the model building process are these various auto diff libraries, where you just have to define the forward model, and then the software will take all the derivatives for you. Um, and so, you know, uh, this was, you know, in, in the modern instantiations, uh, kind of towards just the first one done by Ronan Colbert in the 2000s, uh, but now uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch are the most popular ones. And then, you know, it also, uh, we also want to talk about GPU cards. So GPU cards essentially uh, just a, another uh, processing unit in your computer. You all have them in your laptops. That's actually what runs the graphics. Um, and, you know, they've been central to training deep neural networks because they allow for fast but low precision matrix multiplications. Um, and why they, why, you know, they're built for this because, you know, when you're looking at your screen, you can't tell the difference with your eyes between, like, a pixel value of, you know, 1.001 versus 1 points, you know, 16 zeros more. Um, so, and, and with deep learning, the noise introduced by stochastic gradient methods um, dominates any of that low precision that we lose with the GPU model. So that's why these things that made it possible to train them. And lastly, as Corey mentioned, hyperparameter, hyperparameter tuning. Um, you know, you need to pick the number of uh, layers, number of hidden units, the learning rate step size, all that. Um, and the common way to do that is to use random or grid search over the hyperparameters, and then do, um, you know, calculate your loss on a validation set and pick the one that gives the best loss. And then, but there's also methods of kind of Bayesian optimization, banded algorithms, and reinforcement learning that, that are looking to kind of automate that process and make it better. I think Lars and Pierre and Julian work on stuff like that, so I'll talk to them about it if you want to hear more. And so you might say, okay, you haven't really talked about the model, like what's really, what's changed about neural networks since the 1990s? Um, you know, doesn't seem like anything has changed in compared to, you know, the world we live in. Um, but there's been some small but significant changes. Uh, so one is this, these <coughs> elevation functions. You know, the logistic function was the, was the common one, and right, they were very close to GLMs with these logistic functions. But now we move to rectified linear units. Um, and the reason why is because logistic units would saturate. You'd get over in this region, and your derivatives would die off and go to zero. But the real unit is unbounded to the side. And so, you know, you never get zero gradients. And so if you want to tie this back to maybe something you know about stats, you can think about, uh, you know, piecewise linear spline regression. So this was actually pointed out to me by Lebach. But these ReLU uh, units are essentially the hockey stick function for the splines, um, where you have, you know, uh, x minus some not location uh, uh, with this variable here. And then if it's positive, we, you know, essentially activate the unit, like we'd activate a ReLU function. And, um, you know, so in neural networks, we essentially have one variable more, where instead of just testing the x is greater than, than the not, we're actually doing kind of an angle space where this beta vector is on our weights. And so we're testing you know, if the weights and the uh, input is within some cosine uh, adjusted by the not. And, uh, and obviously another big difference is that you know, splines, you could probably set that not yourself based on maybe some intuition you have about the problem. But you know these, you know, these knots in a neural network are completely learned by the network itself, by gradient descent. 
And, and yeah, these would be the bias variables. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Ford also mentioned regularization. Regularization is very important uh, for these models. And, you know, before people were doing things like L2 penalties, or you might call it weight decay. Uh, but now we're doing stochastic regularization strategies called dropout, um, where all you do is it's kind of naive in some senses that you just set uh, some hidden units to zero in the network and train under this stochastic perturbation process. And it'll regularize the network. And uh, you know, uh, so you know, Pierre's a good paper on this if you want to read and understand more the intuition behind it. Um, but one way, way I like to think about it is just spike and slab variable selection. I think the person mentioned that at his talk. Um, but if you look at kind of this Hulo and Malik paper from 1998, they actually kind of write out the dropout equation with like x times Bernoulli variables times the weight matrix. Um, but they were interested in doing variable selection. You know, they wanted to know which variable should be included in their model. Whereas you know, Hinton was thinking about it in terms of just a regularization mechanism to improve the generalization of these neural networks. And thinking about this perspective, under some assumptions, if you assume kind of a Gaussian prior on the weights, you can actually generalize this to a bunch of different marginal priors. So, you know, a Bernoulli noise model just corresponds to the spike and slab. You can think about Gaussian noise, it's also used. Um, I don't know what marginal prior this induces, but it's a chi square uh, on the variance. And then you can think about you know, half Cauchy noise would be a horseshoe prior. So you know, that's one way kind of I, I like to think about to unify these things. And then lastly, you can think of these called skip connections, where before you would have just you know previous hidden units times weights uh, transformed by some nonlinearity. But now people do the same formula, which is add in the hidden units back in. Um, again, like kind of another maybe even naive modification. You're going, oh, how did I not think of that myself, or how did I not try it, or how do I not have a bug in my code that does that by accident and improve that performance? Um, but you know, one thing you can think of as doing is if you move this variable to the other side, it's sort of now the nonlinear is modeling the residual instead of the full transformation. So it's kind of offloading some of the representation uh, kind of responsibility. And then, you know, just to visit, revisit these computer vision results, um, you know, the first kind of big image that jump was done by rock, dropout and reloos and uh, about an eight layer neural network. But, you know, uh, this latest performance is with skip connections and 150 plus. And just to kind of redo the, the neural, neural network diagrams with these innovations, you know, we just have our hidden layer, but now it's multiplied thousand wise with a dropout sample. Now when we have our skip connection, uh, transporting this hidden layer to the next one. <clears throat> okay, so now you know, we talked a lot about prediction and conditional models. You might say, okay, what about unsupervised problems? You know, latent feature analysis, factor analysis, things like that. Are this deep learning you know, good for that? Does it have anything to say about that? Um, and so you know, I'll, again, I'll start with a model you'll all hopefully know of or heard of or remember. It's called factor analysis. We have some latent variable Z multiplied by a loading matrix A with some bias and some noise, and that gives you your feature X. Um, and so essentially you're trying to find a low dimensional representation that covers kind of the true semantic meanings of X without all the observation noise. And you know, the, kind of, the kind of main deep learning model for unsupervised problems is an autoencoder. And this is a bit weird, but essentially we have the same neural network set up before where you put in X and transform it by several hidden layers. But now we predict the mean of x back. You know, we're just kind of using x to predict itself. And then, um, you know, just using kind of the math notation here, it's the same setup as before. But now we have this weird thing where x is kind of conditioned on itself. So you might say, like, you know, why does that even work? But the, uh, why it works is that we usually pick these thin layers to be smaller than the dimensionality of x. So it's, you know, compressing and, and kind of compressing out the observation modes, hopefully. But you know, you might say like a factor analysis, we can actually you know, you sample from this model. It's kind of a proper generative model of x. Whereas this one, you know, how do you sample from an autoencoder? It's kind of ill-posed. Um, and so you might say, are, are these two methods related? You know, they seem kind of different. But one way to relate them is to principal component analysis. You know, under some linearity assumptions for an autoencoder and some noise assumptions for a uh, uh, factor analysis, you can both show their PCA and therefore equivalent themselves. You know, Tipping and Bishop have a nice paragraph in this in their one paper, and also uh, Pierre showed this for autoencoders back in 1989. But you know, may say the more interesting thing, how do we show their equivalence in a nonlinear way? 
And so there's a thing called nonlinear factor analysis, which dates back further, but the first um, instance I found that's nonlinear in both the factors and parameters is this uh, mean, yeah, 1993, um, where now we have a nonlinear function here before mapping it to our output x. Um, and if you assume that nonlinearity is defined by a neural network, then you have what you know, people would call a density network. This was defined by uh, McKay and Gibbs in 1999, where essentially you have the same kind of stochastic length variable z transformed through multiple deterministic hidden layers, then predicting the mean of x you know, as the output from that. So you know, I don't think I don't think even uh, you know Mackay uh, uh, cites factor analysis in the paper, but it's essentially a particular form of nonlinear factor. And then you might say, okay, how do we get to autoencoders from there? Well, I'll skip over some details, but essentially if you assume a, a particular inference strategy, namely variational inference with what's called an amortization model, but basically if you use a neural network to predict the latent features back, you get something that looks like this. Again, I'm kind of skipping a lot of orientation here, but you have one neural network that performs inference, and the other half that performs you know, generation, and you might see this in the deep learning literature called a variational autoencoder. You know, they kind of, Kind of uh, you know, are sloppy with terminology because variational autoencoder is a particular generative model and a particular inference strategy. It's not really a coherent generative model itself. Um, so it's kind of nonlinear factor analysis with a neural network predicting the factors. Um, and so why do we care about variational autoencoders or why do deep learning care? Well, they found that uh, you know you can do this really cool interpolation in the latent space for images. So for instance, like moving the different Z components. We can change your skin color or age or gender or image saturation. Um, you know, I doubt you could do that with just a linear factor analysis model. We kind of need these deeper, richer models to do kind of image manipulation. Um, but also, kind of, I have some recent work I like is that by Emily Fox and others out of University of Washington, where they're using these BAEs and kind of more traditional group factor analysis setups. You know, they're using MEG data and, and just kind of closer to maybe what uh, statisticians would expect from models like this. That's a very recent paper, though, so it's kind of just, just putting that. So, research opportunity for And then I'll hand it back to Corey for some discussion of state, state space model. All right. Thank you, Eric. I like this model of switching back and forth between the PFTC and the NRS and the other folks. I recommend it. Uh, so, hopefully, you're starting to realize there are some very interesting connections between uh, deep neural networks and statistical models that are not apparent from your jargon when you start looking at more deeply and you start to see these connections. Another one that I think is, is going to become increasingly important, and I think is well worth looking at if you're, if you're a statistician, is a, a time series sequence analysis. So traditionally, statistically, in state-space models, in deep learning, these things would be called recurrent neural networks. So let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, let's say we have sequential data. So uh, we're trying to predict y uh, given x, uh, and we're going to go through some hidden representations. Uh, so each of these Columns here could be thought of as a, a neural network, if you like, as we've been talking about them. Uh, except now the index is uh, looks like it might be time or sequence. So in fact, the y's are, are correlated, uh, typically, and uh, perhaps the x's as well. Um, so uh, naturally, uh, it makes a lot of sense here to couple your, your model over time. And in, in neural network language, uh, this is referred to as a recurrent neural network. And in particular, uh, the coupling happens at the, at the latent level, the hidden variable level. Um, and each time slice here could have multiple layers of Z. Z might represent sort of much of a stacking of layers. Uh, but this is the general structure of the model. So we've taken our uh, static, if you like, mapping from X to Y, but now we've coupled them over time and made a more complicated model, essentially. Uh, a big area where these types of models are used, for example, is in language modeling. Uh, so just to give you a kind of concrete example, uh, these things would train on billions of, of, of uh, words of text. Uh, and so the input, uh, we predicting this is the output, the next word, the input is the previous word. And there's some representation here that's keeping track, not just of the previous word, but also what's the context of the sentence, what's going to be on before. And uh, this is found to be quite powerful compared to, say, uh, more traditional n-gram techniques that are, you could think of as, as uh, Merkle models on directly on the words. There are many extensions, things like long short term memory, we're not going to talk about, uh, but a lot of activity in this area, a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, 
Now, if you're looking at this picture that I've just shown you, it looks for all, you know, all intents and purposes like a classical state space model in statistics, in time series analysis, where there's a very rich literature, uh, particularly for linear Gaussian models, but also nonlinear extensions in over the years. And again, you have the same general idea that uh, you have inputs, exogenous inputs, you have a latent uh, state space, and then your observations are conditioned at each time step on the latent uh, state vector. Um, now, there's some differences. The, the structure looks generally the same. Um, the recurrent neural network, let's go back to that for a minute, it has, its, it has a dynamics equation, like the state space model. It has an observation equation. Um, so, uh, you know, this thing is, is coupled over time. And some key differences with state space models is that the, the latent variables here in recurrent neural networks, there's no distributional assumptions about them. We don't think of them as stochastic in the standard recurrent model. They're just deterministic nonlinear functions. And this, this, is, this has its pluses and minuses. It has advantages and drawbacks. Um, so if we compare them directly, uh, RNNs, recurrent neural networks, and state space models, um, they both use latent state representations, often to go from many uh, high dimensional x's and y's down to a low dimensional representation. Uh, the outputs are, are independent, conditioned on the state of time t, and you can train these things with, with, with gradient methods. So that's common to both. Uh, but the, the difference is, in some sense, because it's not putting distributional assumptions and Gaussian assumptions on the, on the z uh, state variables, the RNNs have, have uh, more representational power. Um, however, that, that comes at a cost. It's harder to handle because there's no uh, distributional, you can't uh, marginalize out uh, various variables. If you want to handle missing data, if you want to do forecasting in a coherent way, if you want to be Bayesian, uh, it's harder to do this in, in recurrent neural networks. This is a, currently a topic of uh, uh, fairly intense research by various groups, uh, but they pay a price. Also, the recurrent neural network is, is somewhat less interpretable. It's quite hard to interpret what those states are doing. Um, there's fair bit of research going on here. Um, I point you to, uh, for example, David Sontag at, at MIT. He sent some of these papers from his group, and there's other people as well that you can, can look into. There's many variants. So one of the things that the machine learning computer science people are quite creative when they come up with these models. So you can, you can take this recurrent neural network idea and do a lot of different things with it. So uh, one of the things you can do instead of having an output at every time sequence point or at every position in the sequence, you might just have an output at the end. So you're trying to classify that sentence or that piece of text. So you're, you just have a sort of a many to one mapping from your sequence to a single output. Uh, machine translation, you could think of for two languages as a many-to-many. -many. Uh, one sentence in English, another sentence in Chinese. Uh, you can have many-to-many -many word prediction. You can go from an image as pixels to text output for image captioning. So the ways that these things have been used is quite creative, but they're, they're all based on a very similar basic architecture. And they tie back to, in many respects, to the idea of state-based models in statistics. All right, I'm going to give you back to Eric, and he's going to take it home. Yeah, so I think in the abstract, we promised to use some open problems to you know, jumpstart your research with. Uh, so let's just talk about some of those. Um, you know, so kind of the biggest problems in, in uh, you know, our networks that we right now is you know better understanding of just how it all works. How does the optimization work? How does the regularization work? You know, why are these neural networks kind of successful as they are, given there was so much you know maybe stacked against them for a long time? I mean, a lot of people fit more often. You know, why, did, why does the stochastic gradient uh, work unexpectedly well? You know, are there other, uh, other alternative optimization strategies? And I think, you know, Pierre's work saying that backprop is optimal under some conditions, but, you know, some people are trying other, other alternatives. Um, and so, but a big problem with these, and probably why they haven't been applied to statistics as, you know, much as we, we would hope, is that, you know, they're very data hungry, very, very large data sets. Um, and so, you know, of course, like better regulation is, is a key to making them less data hungry, but also perhaps Bayesian formulations for you know we use priors to you know incorporate inductive biases for sparsity, or you know we can leverage other prior information. <coughs> and also, you know, uh, more exploration of non-image data, non-IID data. Um, you know, what happens if you know, the data is correlated, censored, biased, etc. How does the deep neural network react? You know, does it just exaggerate those biases, which is you know maybe one direction, or does you know due to those uh, various headed layers does it kind of stamp out this, you know, hopefully noise. And then also, you know, just model interpretation and uncertainty quantification, essentially what statisticians do best, the bread and butter, you know, can we understand what the model has learned, how will it fail, when will it fail, 
you know, can we get calibrated in certain DS modes? Um, and so, kind of extending from this, um, I'll address some questions left and answered, perhaps in a previous seminar. <laughs> so I think someone asked, you know, what's Bayesian methods? Like, what's the role of Bayesian methods in deep learning? You know, can they help with architecture selection, for instance? Um, and yeah, so this is kind of the, one of the first things people thought about when they were doing Bayesian deep learning. Um, so you can select a number of nodes. And one simple way to do that is just to put group priors on the uh, variance of the weights uh, outgoing from a hidden unit. So this is called the Automatic Relevance Determination Framework, um, or ARD for short. short. Essentially, just you tie the variance so all the units grow or shrink together, and therefore, you know, if they all shrink to zero, then the, the node has essentially been proved. Um, and so, you know, Neil and uh, David McKay did that way back when. Neil Lawrence has a paper on it. Um, then, uh, you know, Ryan Adams has a paper of doing more Bayesian non parametric ideas using the Indian buffet process to select the width of the network. Um, and then, Port and I have done some work on it as well using Thurston process ideas. And then, um, this paper from Harvard uses the horseshoe prior to do number of node selection. So I think Nick Colson said no one had used the horseshoe prior. Uh, this recent paper has. Um, and then selecting the number of layers, kind of this Adams paper also does this too. That in some sense, they kind of went to the limit of what's possible with kind of Bayesian nonparametrics and in, in neural networks, where they use a cascaded Indian buffet process to predict the number of layers as well. Um, but Alex Graves has a interesting paper on kind of adaptive computation time for current neural networks that also does some stuff like this. Although it's not particularly Bayesian, so maybe that's a open topic to work on. And then lastly, I would say that kind of the main interest or main goal of using Bayesian uh, neural networks is for uncertainty quantification. You know, like if you're a self-driving car company like Uber, you need to probably need a convolutional neural network to do your object recognition, you know, to detect if there's a you know, car or a person around the car. And uh, you know, you don't only need to identify it to say how certain or uncertain it is that it, that is a person, that it is a car. And if it's uncertain, right, the car should slow down. Um, and so there's a lot of work kind of on doing that for you know, certain quantification for safe automation. You know, um, so pointers there. So I think another question was that you know, statisticians make their money, or you know, the bread and butter is inferential questions. You know, not prediction per se. Um, you know, how can deep learning help with that? And of course, it, you really can. You know, if you have a specified model that you know the, the doctor or the scientist knows and knows, you know, what is the value of that one particular parameter, right? It doesn't make sense to use a deep neural network then, but it can help with inference. You know, it can prove the speed or accuracy of your inference. So, um, for instance, with MCMC, um, you know, Babak, Linga, Pierre, Andrew Holbrook have uh, done some work on using neural networks in the. Uh, for a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to predict the gradient, so you don't actually actually calculate the gradient, you just predict it with the neural network to, to speed things up in some sense. Uh, but also people have done with uh, trying to distill MCMC chains into neural networks, so you don't have to, you just kind of use the neural network to predict your next proposal or MCMC uh, step. And also for variational inverse, there's been a ton of work on using neural networks. Um, like I mentioned with the variational autoencoder, people are using it to predict the latent factors, so instead of learning a variational distribution for every factor independently, you just predict them with the neural network. Um, also stuff on using kind of what they call implicit models, just using a neural network to generate samples so you don't have to pick a particular distribution to, for your approximation. And then uh, another question was, um, can deep learning you know, methods be useful for non-IID data? Uh, example, uh, observational studies. Um, and you know, so there's some papers doing kind of Rubin, Neyman potential outcomes framework. Um, some doing causal graph models. Um, but also there's kind of deep survival analysis and you know relation data, relational data neural networks. You know, I'm just adding some pointers here. I'll give you the slides at the end, and you can investigate those yourself if you're interested. But you know, obviously there is some work, but you know, a lot, a lot to do. Uh, and then you know, just wrapping things up. Um, you know. Just to kind of reformulate like the deep learning era in one slide, you know, prior to 2000, neural networks um, you know, didn't work that well. as being for better. What has changed since? You know, more data. You know, image net size data sets with 15 million images. You know, better hardware, GPUs, uh, model changes. You know, small but crucial changes to the model architecture, and then essentially better understanding and better appreciation of kind of first order stochastic gradient methods. You know, and then just to summarize what we said, you know, neural networks are extremely flexible, but that's also kind of with great responsibility comes great, uh, great power comes great responsibility. Um, 
And uh, you know, very complex, require lots of data. Uh, focus on prediction, but you know, can we move into more model interpretation? Uh, you know, learning is just maximum likely for the most part. Yeah, you know, there's many links you can contribute uh, to both the understanding of deep learning models, but perhaps deep learning can be used in your kind of model building and pipeline as well. And so some further reading you might be interested. Like a lot of this is just based on what Leo Bryman said uh, you know, back in 2001 about the, the uh, two cultures and statistical modeling. Um, but you know that doesn't give the details of deep learning. So you know you might want to look at uh, Efron and Hasty's book, Chapter 18, Neural Networks of Deep Learning. As Corey mentioned, that's a really good resource. Um, essentially, what we're doing, you know, Shakir Mohammed, he's a research scientist at DeepMind. He did it first back in 2015. He has essentially a bunch of blog posts that he collected together into one PDF document, where he talks about things like thinking of neural networks as you know, uh, recurrent and stacked GLMs. So a lot of stuff comes from him. And then uh, we have a paper in preparation that we hope to have done for, before we gave this talk, but it probably won't be done until the summer. Um, but <laughs> this is the working title, but uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, thank you. And then you can get the slides uh, right here on my website, um, backslash dl for stats.pdf. Uh, and then they have all the you know, references here. Maybe there, so you're conditioning and 
some sense on the predictor space through the hidden layers. Have people looked at this and how well one can try and quantify and sort of deal with the problem? Yeah, I've seen that to kind of speed up like Bayesian neural networks, but Bayesian neural networks are just really tough to, to you know, get on serious for and stuff. So people just put uh, fires on the last weights, as you say. And uh, I haven't seen them applied to kind of you know kind of hardcore statistical uh, applications yet. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely one thing you could do. You just treat them as you know, like we said, a new set of features, and we just want to get certain for those particular things. Yeah. So in terms of dropout, I've heard it kind of described as like the intuition. I'm dropping out random nodes, so I'm training a bunch of subnetworks so they can like vote, and that's going to do better. But of course, when I'm training it, the, a lot of the, the weights are all shared between the different networks. So I'm wondering yeah. if you can help give me a bit more of an intuition for why this should actually be a good thing to do, other than just it works, which we know it does. But yeah, I mean, so I'd like to tell like the story Jeff Hinton tells when he came up with it. He said he was like in a bank, and he saw that they were like moving colors at, at regular intervals. I don't know why he was in a bank for so long, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. But, but he asked someone why they do that, and it, apparently it was bank policy to kind of randomly move tellers so they couldn't like uh, conspire to launder money or steal money. And so that was kind of, that's how he says he got the idea. I don't know how true that is, but he, you know, he wanted to kind of break those co-adaptations in neural networks to essentially have to rely on kind of, you know, you couldn't rely on one other particular node being on at a certain time. Um, but yeah, the, uh, but kind of, I mean, I don't think of it in terms of like that submodel ensembling as maybe other people do. Maybe, I don't know, if someone else has an idea of, of how to explain it that way. But, um, you know, I just think of it like random forests and just adding randomness to something that will overfit always kind of regularizes it. And so I think that's a better way to think about it. I don't know how, if you can actually formalize like what the ensemble is doing. Do you anticipate this um, to eventually enable these networks to be more understandable? Let's say you use something like this to um, qualify people for loans. All right, with this kind of approach of, of understanding, uh, be able to tell you that yes, I can. I can tell. I understand how it works now. There is no racial bias in this in this type of analysis that we're doing. Yeah, so that's definitely an open problem. It's hard. I mean, some people try to actually look at the hidden units and will try to like do certain things to them to see, you know, maybe I can do like a perturbation analysis. And, and, um, but I, I think that's kind of the, the major motivation, at least when I think of perturbation methods, you know, getting that posterior predictive distribution to see kind of my uncertainty or how, you know, certain or uncertain my net is for particular inputs. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a growing field of kind of bias and fairness in machine learning that there's kind of tutorials on it and it's in uh, seen at all the big conferences now. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't know much about that, but yeah, they're thinking about things like bias in the data, you know, like kind of more of a causal perspective, but also kind of from the model perspective as well. Um, in relation to what you mentioned before, um, are you aware of any work uh, looking at uh, producing a uh, feedback information coming back from from the the later set uh, layer? Back to uh, Well, I mean, that's what kind of a bad propagation is doing. Well, well, that's learning. Right? Yeah. What I mean is, if, you know, during prediction, during uh, uh, the inference, so there's a. Yes. Like, like, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I mean, so there used to be these things called deep belief networks, which were directed graphical models that take some latent representation and, and you know, generate data. And, you know, they would have, and then, so essentially when you do an inference, and then you kind of go up the network and down the network. But those are all unsupervised. Like in a, in a supervised setting, I don't know what the backward pass would do per se, besides updating the parameters. Do you have anything more particular? I mean, you, you could think about reinforcement learning as being that class where it's more sequential and you can further take further actions based on what you want to do. Feedback in the reinforcement learning. The, the deep learning part there is essentially very good function approximation. Yeah, I would say that as we use neural network to do the prediction, sometimes you will find that your prediction uh, credit involved in those things like the favor stand delay in the original ones. Okay. So uh, sometimes we also we also need some challenges in that we see that just kind of favor stand delay. So I don't understand what you mean by So I think that as we do the neural network learning, as learning all the prediction, okay, you will find later on. We'll find the prediction of the call. You'll see that as a several snap delay. Yeah. 
but then that may become about the challenge to go over this one. Uh, I didn't encounter that per se. I, I don't know, that sounds like a specific. Maybe we can chat about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Five out of time. All right, well thank you.